the Bible is the world's first hyperlink text because many of the verses refer to many other verses. And that means it's a very complicated text because you can find your way through it many, many ways. Like, the more a text is cross-referenced, the more pathways through it there are. And you can imagine that that explodes exponentially. So you might say, well, what does a Bible verse mean? And the answer is, well, it means whatever it means in reference to all of its cross-references. And then each of those cross-references has cross-references. So it's a web. It's a web of meaning, a very complex web of meaning. And so that's what makes it deep, technically speaking. Okay, so, so what does that mean? This is a good way of understanding a symbol. Let's see if I can explain this properly. Imagine that you have a, a belief of any sort. Um, then imagine that there are other beliefs that are statistically likely to co-occur with that belief. Right? So if you believe one thing, here's four other things you're likely to believe. And then each of those four has four things four beliefs that are likely to occur with them. That's what you'd say if someone was conservative, right? If you know one of their beliefs, you can predict many other beliefs. Mm -hmm. Or if they're liberal. Every idea, no idea exists independently. It exists in a web of ideas. That web is something like the statistical probability that another idea will co-occur with that idea. That's what the large language models map. They map that mathematically. So here's a way of thinking about it. Imagine a word like uh, um, hilt, like the hilt of a sword, H-I-L-T. Well, how do you know that's a word? Well, you know the meaning of the word, but you also know it's a word because a word is identifiable because of the statistical regularities between the letters. You know perfectly well that Z-Q-N-X is not a word. Why? Well, because there's no word that has that statistical relationship. There's no word that's four consonants, not one. You have to have a vowel in your word. So one of the ways that helps you identify a word is your understanding of the statistical regularity between the letters. So um, the word C-I-L-T, that's not a word. But it's quite a lot like a word. It's a lot more like a word than Z-Q-N-X. So a word has predictable statistical relationships between its letters. Words exist in relationship to each other. Patterns of words exist in relationship to other patterns of words. Paragraphs exist in relationship to paragraphs. All that's a mathematical domain of statistical regularity. That's what a symbol is. A symbol is the complex of ideas that are associated with a particular idea. And so when you're exploring the symbolic landscape, say, of the biblical stories, you're exploring the statistical relationship between all, between all the ideas. Well, that's a reality, that statistical relationship. It's a reality. It's like, does a witch live in a swamp or a high rise? Well, witch lives in a swamp. You know that. Well, why? Well, because in, in portrayals of witches from time immemorial, witches are likely to be in swamps. So when you think witch, that's one of the things you sort of think along with it. And everything we think is like that. And the part of what the biblical corpus is, is a walk through. How would you say it? It's a walk through. The patterns of character and order that have been reliably observed to exist, to coexist over thousands of years. That's a good way of thinking about it. So here's an example. This is very complicated, but here's an example. So I talked about God. For, God for Abraham was the spirit of adventure, the call to adventure. So this is a definition. This is very much worth knowing because people have no idea what to do with the concept of God. It's like God's the call to adventure. That's a definition. Okay, but that's not all. So God for Noah wasn't the call to adventure. Not exactly. For Noah, God was the call to batten down the hatches when, when chaos looms. 
So imagine that you're a wise man, which is how Noah's portrayed in the story. So you've actually, you see things straight. You're wise for your time and place, which is how Noah is described. Your, your eyes are open. And you get an intuition that all hell's about to break loose. And so you take the appropriate precautions. Okay, God is defined in that story as the spirit that comes to the wise to have them prepare in times of trouble. And then the co-occurrence of those stories is the insistence that the call to adventure and the call to prepare are the same thing. That's the monotheism that's underneath it. Right, and so what the biblical corpus is doing is aggregating visions of what's highest and making the presumption that they're all manifestations of a unity. Now, the alternative is that it's a plurality, right? I mean, you're going to cope with this one way or another. Like, either everything that calls to you morally is the manifestation of one thing in some complex manner, or there's a plurality of moralities. Those are the only options. The monotheistic insistence is that what's highest is, in the final analysis, one thing. So what else? So how else is it portrayed in the Old Testament stories? God is the voice of conscience. That's another portrayal. And so you could say God is the voice of conscience. God is the impetus to prepare in times of chaos. And God is the call to adventure. And that's all the same God. It's just manifesting itself. The same spirit is making itself manifest in different conditions. In the Christian corpus, God is identical with voluntary. God is the spirit of voluntary self-sacrifice. Right, right. And that's the same as the spirit of adventure. And that's the same as the voice of conscience. And that's the same as the voice of prudence during times of chaos. It's all the same thing. And that's, I think that's right. I think it's, I think that's exactly right. What was the, if you know, what was the most referenced verse in the Bible? It, 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 if I remember right, the graph showed. Yeah, I don't. I that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that actually. It was very. Uh, yeah, it was. I love. See, the, that's a that's a very good question because that's actually one way of determining what idea is central, right? Because some ideas are going to be more central than others. At the bottom of the of the of the visual aid, there was it showed the pa the yes. length, the number of connections, the yes. number of cross references. And I, yeah. it, it was right smack dab in the middle. There was one that would had to be at least double the length of all the yeah, others. Yeah, yeah, right, right. I was just yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah, know. that's for sure. That's Did you sure. put that together? No, no. Someone I found that online. You can find it online if you look up biblical graph of biblical cross references. It'll pop up right away. Something you can probably find for this podcast and I'll show find people. It. Yeah, it's great. It's great. It's great. I'll find you know, it. Your brain is organized like that too, by the way. So it's every neuron isn't connected to every other neuron. That isn't how it works. You, that's too much connection. Actually, that's what starts to happen in a psychedelic experience, is that the number of connections increases dramatically. That's partly why there's that overwhelming sense of increasing meaning. So... But you don't want everything to be connected to everything else. I mean, that's part of the pathology of the modern world. We're connecting everything together. It's like, that's a little too much connection. It's, it's insanity making, right? We may be driving ourselves mad with the interconnectivity online. You know, it's a great way of educating yourself. It's a great way of having access to information. But I'll tell you, man, it's a great way of being connected to all sorts of things you don't want to be connected to.